Uh, excuse me, I'd like to get started. Uh, I have about at least eight hours to cover and about less than two hours. <laughs> so I apologize for leaving stuff out, which is almost inevitable. Um, start, start right in with this, this proposition. Supposing you see in the paper, this is not of course, un, not of course unrealistic, that the Congress has just raised the tariff on steel imports or that it's imposed import quotas on steel. Uh, what, do you, what does one conclude from this? What do you think your, your, your reaction will be to this? Do <clears throat> uh, you think anyone would think by looking at this that, well, Congress must have, for some reason, uh, had an intellectual interest in the steel industry and decided to help it out, or that theoreticians of some sort descended upon Washington to try to get them to do something for steel? Uh, I think that'd be pretty idiotic. I think anybody who has any, any marbles at all will conclude that the steel industry must have lobbied for a higher steel tariff or for steel import quotas. And of course, you would be right. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is, I think everybody would admit this, <clears throat> you have to be extremely naive to think that, that Congress went ahead on its own without consulting, without being lobbied by the steel industry to do that. So if that's true, why is not, if everybody acknowledges this, why is this not called either a conspiracy theory of history or an economic determinism? Uh, this is what is applied as, as, as smear terms to people who use this insight, not just the things like tariffs, but the little wider, things with a little wider reach. Um, so if it's, if it's uh, so almost self-evident that the steel industry lobbies for tariffs and, and that's it, and nobody else does, <clears throat> And they're the driving force behind it. Why can't they do that for other things, for other uh, political measures that are a little, I say, a little broader, um, which could be things like regulatory commission or uh, some kind of public works development or uh, a bond issue or a war. Okay, so <clears throat> what uh, what this sort of what I call power elite analysis you can call call it a lot of things. <clears throat> really involves a simply common sense. It's really Mises talks about the, the task of the historian is to try to figure out the motivations of different actions, also the consequences and the motivations. And when you try to figure out the motivations of actions, it's not, of course, apodictic, to use the great Misesian term. It's not an absolute law. It's using Verstehen, okay? Yet you can pretty, you can pretty well be sure that if a steel tariff is passed, the, it's because the steel industry lobbied for it. <clears throat> So you have to use, the historian has to use judgment <clears throat> and for staying and doing that. And I'd say common sense, I think, is a key thing here. <clears throat> uh, I, think, I think you can divide uh, this sort of government aid to business <clears throat> in four categories, which we might be, de be dealing with here. One is for subsidy, outright subsidy. Two, contracts, which is equivalent to subsidy. <clears throat> Uh, three, an outright grant, well, it's really f five categories, uh, subsidy and a contract are slightly different, but really about the same thing. <clears throat> uh, three, government monopoly privilege. This was done, for example, with, in Europe, in the mercantilist period, uh, su such and such a producer gets a monopoly grant by the government to produce salt, mine salt in, in the kingdom, or to produce playing cards or, or textiles or whatever. <clears throat> uh, Next and more, more important in American history, uh, even though there have been monopoly privileges, more important is government enforced cartelization, uh, restricting supply in the industry in, in order to raise the price. <clears throat> and finally, socialization of costs, which don't get mentioned much, but I think very important, where the businesses lay, uh, load their costs onto the taxpayer, Uncle Sap, to pay for it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see what the... <laughs> Let's see some examples of this. <clears throat> the, um, <laughs> there's, for example, the Illinois Central Railroad, which is the major federally subsidized railroad in the 1850s, before the big transcontinental railroads. It was the big north-south um, hub from Chicago, I think, to New Orleans or Mobile. <clears throat> At any rate, <clears throat> the Illinois Central Railroad, which got heavy federal subsidies, also had connected with the two famous American politicians who were at sword's point and everything else, namely Abraham Lincoln, beloved figure, and, and, and uh, 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 what's, what's the first name of Douglas? Huh? Stephen Douglas, right. Both of them are heavily connected with the Illinois Central Railroad. Abraham Lincoln has been called, has the image of most people of a rail splitter. I guess, he, I, guess, I guess he split rails in his youth, 
But that's not, that's only that's not what he did in maturity. He was a connected with the railroads, all right. But he was a he was a big attorney for Illinois Central Railroad. Uh, it's like you know, it's like calling some 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 corporate lawyer on Wall Street a, a rail splitter, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Stephen Douglas uh, made a, a, a huge amount of money out of the Illinois Central Caper, which he of course argued for and lobbied for in the Senate. <clears throat> He bought up, he found out where the Illinois Central Terminal would be. It's always important where the terminal is going to be in Chicago. And he bought the land up beforehand and then resold the land <laughs> to Illinois Central, making, making a huge bundle on it. <clears throat> okay, that's, these, are, these are direct subs, we, these Well, these are hidden subsidies. The, 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 the important thing here is this. We have a question of motivation. Here is Stephen Douglas. He's arguing in the Senate for a big subsidy to Illinois Central Railroad and landing it in Chicago. Is he going to say to the American public, I'm doing this because I have the land underneath the terminal. I'm gonna make, make millions out of it. I don't think so. <clears throat> He's gonna talk about the national interest, the public, the common good, national defense, national security, general welfare, and all the other garbage, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not saying there's no such thing as general welfare, common good, but the point is, I mean, he even might be one of his motivations. I'm not denying that, but the point is that the, that the economic motivation, I mean, personal economic motivation gets Hidden, it becomes it's under it's under cover. It's under the table. It's the task of the historian not to say that this is his only motivation. The task of the historian to uncover the hidden motivations to figure out what is the economic interest here. Unfortunately, not, there are not too many historians who have been doing this. If you might note, <clears throat> uh, it's not fashionable. I don't know how many thousands of PhD dissertations have been in, in American history. A huge number of them. Almost none of them go into this sort of stuff. This economic interest analysis, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there must have been 10 dissertations about every battle of the Civil War, for example, but very little about this sort of stuff, which I think is even more important. <clears throat> so the, one of the problems here is that since academics won't deal with this because it's not respectable, because it's, it's smeared as conspiracy theory of history and economic determinism, this sort of analysis is left to, how should we say, untrained scholars, uh, journalists, uh, sometimes crackpots, <laughs> uh, who engage in this sort of truth-seeking. And the trouble is, of course, this discredits the movement, the, the, the economic, uncovering the economic interest movement, because, you know, the guy's a little, little kooky in many cases. Um, <laughs> for example, one of the, I'll, I hope to get back to this a little later tonight, but one of the, one of my favorite muckrakers of this sort, you want to call it muckraker, uh, is the, a crazed eye doctor in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Named Dr. Emanuel Josephson, who's uh, done some very interesting work on the Rockefeller World Empire and Franklin Roosevelt. Actually, his best book is the least known. I don't know how much this is known at all, but I mean, <laughs> least known within the framework, within the spectrum. His first book, called Your, about medicine, which you really know something, of course, knows a lot about, called Your Life is Their Toy, which I think is a wonderful title. <laughs> <laughs> Subtitle, Exposé of the AMA and its Rackets. At any rate, when I, one time I visited Dr. Josephson's, uh, uh, I wanted to get, buy one of his pamphlets, which of course are not widely distributed, as you might imagine. And since I wasn't, I didn't live too far away, I decided to drop in on this the official uh, address of Chedney Press, which is the name of his publication. So I thought I'd buy a pamphlet and get out. No, it turns out he, he was his eye doctor office, and he's, uh, and you have this, this field machine, the thing you measure your, you know, your brain tumor, possible brain tumor and all that. <laughs> And the field machine was filled with cobwebs. <laughs> <laughs> and he had pamphlets all over the place on the Rockefellers and things like that. And I, I finally extracted myself. I bought the pamphlet. It took me about three hours to get out of there. It's very interesting. <laughs> interesting character. Obviously, he did not have a busy practice. <laughs> At any rate, so you, but you have to deal with this if you want to find out what's going on in the world, okay? Either historically or in the contemporary history. <laughs> okay, another, <laughs> get back to another example. Um, Socialization of costs. Uh, in, in the Civil War period, General Grenville Dodge, who was who an was, uh, important entrepreneur, becomes a general in the U.S. in the Northern Army, takes a, a number of troops of the U.S. Army and, and uses the troops to clear out the Indians from uh, Iowa and Nebraska, or whatever. Uh, he did it, and then he resigned after he succeeded in clearing out the Indians, a considerable cost in lives of the soldiers and taxpayer money. He then resigns from the army to become what? To become head of, uh, or one of the heads of uh, Union Pacific, which got the, 
which got the land rights, which got the subsidy for the whole land area of the, of the area which he cleared. Now, in other words, and notice this was going on here. In other words, they want, a, they, they want the Union Pacific. You want the railroad in this area. First, you get the, the Congress to subsidize. They give you huge land grants plus construction subsidies. Secondly, you want to clear out the Indians. The Indians are a pain in the neck in the area. So you, you don't do it yourself. You don't, have, you don't organize a private army to do it. You get the taxpayers, the suckers, to do it. Plus the conscripted soldiers who think they're fighting the Civil War. Actually, they're clearing out the Indians <laughs> for, on behalf of Union Pacific. <clears throat> It's called socialization of costs. Okay? Another, another example of that, a very different example, in 1900 or so, the public school, there was an agitation on the part of the pub, for the public school system to expand its education from reading, writing, and arithmetic to teaching foreign languages, particularly Spanish. Well, who, who did this agitation? Uh, you could say, well, Spanish teachers, but not really. Actually, the real agitation came from businessmen, business groups who, were, who wanted to send salesmen down to Latin America. And they wanted somebody else, in other words, the taxpayer, to pick up the tab. Instead of them having to train people in Spanish, let, this, let, the, let the idiot taxpayers do it through the public school system. That's another example of socialization of cost. <clears throat> of course, businessmen always like to have, they get the profits and the taxpayer picks up the cost. It's very much like the savings and loan movement, where, uh, <laughs> where <laughs> savings and loan movement, where the, where the taxpayer guarantees their liabilities and they have freedom to invest in assets. I wish I had got the kind of business. It would be great. OK, so the, uh, another example of subsidy. I'm just I'm picking them uh, more, almost at random. But at any rate, uh, is, um, I'll give you a, a, maybe two more examples of subsidies. The Transcontinental Railroad caper, where not only Union Pacific, but the whole only Union Pacific, Central Pacific, Southern Pacific, Northern Pacific, the big four, got huge land grant subsidies of the best land, by the way, of all the areas around the around the uh, track, plus construction subsidies from Congress. Uh, the famous story of the, irrelevant to us here, because Leland's, because uh, uh, Central Pacific, which Leland Stanford was one of the uh, four big owners of, uh, sent Collis Hunting, that was a, sort of the major guy of the big four, Collis Hunting went to Washington with a, with a bag of, I think, $100,000 in gold coins, I remember it. When he left Washington, there was no money in the there was no money in the bag. Gold coins had suddenly disappeared. They had not been stolen. They were distributed as boodle to various executive people in the executive branch and in Congress. <clears throat> as a result of which, they got you know Central Pacific gets the huge subsidies. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, Representative Oakes Ames of Maine, Republican of Maine, was one of the key figures in pushing this through. Was also a shovel manufacturer, and he got the shovel contract for Central Pacific, which is quite lucrative. <laughs> okay. So all these things, all these things have to be dug up. They are not in the standard histories. Okay. Some of them a little bit are, a few of them are, but not much. <clears throat> just another, just the leap to the present. I, 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 the problem with this sort of thing is I might get stuck in the 19th century and never got up, up to the present. To come to the 20th century, there's, for example, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, I'm going to say that he's one of my least favorite politicians. Like, I have so many least favorites, it's difficult to... <laughs> Whoever I focus on, I hate. <laughs> so, uh, the... Um, how did Lyndon Baines Johnson... He gets, of course, as we know, but Lyndon Baines Johnson is a poor, uh, poor Southerner. He comes into Congress, he gets a fairly low salary, he emerges for many years of Congress as a multimillionaire. How did he do this? Uh, <laughs> One of the ways he did it was that he was a, uh, his wife owned this radio station, which he got special privilege from the FCC. Uh, I think he was also on the communications, uh, Senate Communications Committee. At any rate, Lyndon, Lyndon's whole career, okay, was financed by a, Texas, a big, big Texas construction company called Brown and Root, uh, headed by the, the beloved figure of George Brown, 80-year-old George, I guess he was never, no, not always 80, but I think of him as an octogenarian. <laughs> Anyway, so he was George Brown's uh, men, uh, uh, disciple, you <laughs> should call him that. And when Johnson got to be president, he handed out all sorts of construction contracts to the federal government, including, of course, the, all the bases, military bases we had to build in Vietnam, all of which went to Brown and Root. And you notice the connection here. You have a Brown and Root uh, socialism, so to speak. <laughs> um, now, could you say, when you judge motivation, was... Uh, some, certainly, there's something in here about this. I mean, did, did Lyndon Johnson uh, 
expand the Vietnam War just because of Brown and Rubin. Who knows? Probably not. But you know, certainly it's an element in there which has to be considered and usually is not talked about by historians. Okay. Uh, okay the, uh, I don't know how really to get to go back. I just want to say, I'm trying to, I'm trying to zip through the early American period, but the, um, the bad guys, uh, I'm going to I'm explain why I use terms like bad and evil a little bit later on. <laughs> the bad guys uh, from, say, 1780s until past the Civil War were usually centered in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was like the center of evil until... Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was where the power elite <laughs> lived. The, uh, the, the first major bad guy in Pennsylvania was a guy who was called in the history books the financier of the American Revolution, Robert Morris. Actually, he was not the financier of the American Revolution. The American Revolution financed him to, to <laughs> millions, millions. Nobody knows how much he stole from the taxpayer because there was no auditing then. There was no general accounting office, none of the other alleged checks and balances. He was the economic czar of the, of the, of the Continental Congress. And he, just, he, he handed out contracts using taxpayer money and, 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 print, and paper money and all that, handed out contracts to... To, for, this, for the war effort, for supplies and all that, to his own partners, his own relatives, his partners, his mercantile partners, like William, uh, William Bingham and people like, like that. And so the whole thing was an unbelievable racket. <clears throat> he, also, he also created the first central bank in the United States, the Bank of North America, which is his own private bank, which was set up by, by Morris as the economic czar of Congress. Uh, which had, by the way, a first little teeny little business cycle. It was only in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is like the major center. So it was a little Philadelphia business cycle, boom-bust cycle. Uh, fortunately, Morris got kicked out after the war was over, and so the, the Bank of North America collapsed. And uh, one thing, you know, there are very few cases in, in world history, and certainly in, or in American history, where justice triumphs. I'll talk about why I use the word justice, too, a little bit later. <laughs> but justice triumphs. The case of Robert Morris, justice triumphs. He ended his days in debtor's prison. He went bankrupt. In those days, if you go bankrupt, you don't just sail past for another, you know, fleecing some more creditors. <laughs> There's no chapter seven or chapter 11. You go to jail until you can pay it. It's, just, it's difficult to get, make money in jail. They usually stay there. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, I just want to talk a little bit about the Federalist Program, which was the first power elite program, which was, by the way, the Constitution was driven through America against the will of most of the people. It was driven through on a blitzkrieg. You have to realize it was in the dead of winter, most of it. First of all, you realize there's no roads then, no, no TV, no telephone, no, no, you know, no nothing, no radio, no nothing, uh, no, and, and, no, and, no, and no land transportation, no roads. So, so uh, since the Federalists controlled the urban areas, uh, plus the power, most of the power elite, they were able to push this through. <clears throat> uh, and the pro Federalist program, which was instituted by Morris, by this time, was out of the picture, but his heirs and spiritual heirs and successors like Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so what do they do? They pay off the government bondholders at par. The public debt had depreciated during the Revolutionary War and after it. The taxpayers are forced to pay it off at par. I want to, I want to focus on this a little bit, the whole public debt question. Uh, the public debt is a big ripoff. The public debt is a situation where, the bondhold, where public creditors, in other words, the bondholders, uh, went out at the expense of the taxpayers. This is a fantastic loot situation. Nobody, we don't focus on this much. We talk about how terrible the deficit is. We don't talk about how one of the big consequences of the deficit, are those bondholders are ripping us off, ripping off the taxpayers. And of course, in many cases, they're the same people, but obviously, there's a, even, in that, even then, there's a, there's a handling charge. <laughs> but of course, they're not really the same people. There's a, there's a, net, a net shift from, from bondholders, from taxpayers to bondholders. <clears throat> Um, the Federalists uh, established a central bank, the, the first regular central bank, the Bank of the United States, in order to have cheap credit, inflationary credit for favored businessmen, high tariffs to protect uh, inefficient American in, uh, manufacturers and artisans, a big navy to compulsorily open up markets abroad for exports, and higher taxes to pay for all this stuff, and, uh, and also, of course, centralization of power in the, in the national government. Uh, that was mostly in Philadelphia. Morris is in Philadelphia. The Bank of the United States is in Philadelphia. The whole power elite was there. <clears throat> it comes to the War of 1812, and uh, <clears throat> the, um, 
the Philadelphian Stephen Gerard, who was by that time one of the richest people in the country, was a merchant, uh, one of the richest people in the country, also the major public creditor and also the, the major stockholder of the Bank of the United States. After the, the, Dem the Democrat Republic, the Jeffersonians were able to get rid of the Bank of the United States at long last. Um, during the war uh, and after the war, uh, Dallas, uh, uh, Gerard puts in his own guy, Alexander Dallas, his own lawyer, as Secretary of Treasury. He gets Madison, uh, the, evil, the evil Madison, to get him at, at Secretary of Treasury, and Madison then pushes through the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, Nicholas Biddle, also from Philadelphia, becomes the head of it. So you have a whole Philadelphia stain throughout, uh, throughout this whole period. <clears throat> uh, also, in eight, after uh, 1815 and 1820, during the Panic of 1819, is the first organized protectionist movement in the United States. There had been tariffs before, such as during the war, for example, during the War of 1812, but there was no mass protectionist movement. Now they needed, they felt they needed a protectionist movement. It was all generated from Pennsylvania. Uh, the guy in Congress who in introduced the idea of a high tariff was Representative Henry Baldwin of Pittsburgh, himself an iron manufacturer. And the big propagandist was Henry, was Henry Carey, uh, alleged economist and printer of Philadelphia, and news, news uh, writer, who also wanted a big high tariffs on printing, on you know, paper printing and all that. So uh, they generated a protect, they, the, the tariff movement didn't work in 1820, but there was, it was lively from then on. <clears throat> By the way, talking about printing, I have to realize in this whole early period, one of the key ways in which the government managed to manipulate the press was through printing contracts. In those days, the government didn't print anything. There was no government printing office. The government would lease, would let out, was sort of privatized uh, printing. The government would let out contracts to the press. And so, of course, they, you know, they, they kept the, the good guys, the guys whom they bought off in the press were the guys whom they used. So it was, it was a big thing to vie for the printing contract from the local and state government <clears throat> and national government. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, one of my least favorite people in American history, <laughs> uh, a racketeer of the, of the highest order, <clears throat> very smart racketeer, I'm not, I'm not denying that, uh, came out, he was a, again, of course, in Philadelphia, <laughs> uh, gave, was also, uh, got the, was, a, was a printer, of course, in Philadelphia, as we all know, he got the printing, right, first of all, he agitates for paper money. First, you know, one of the first paper monies in the country. He wants paper money is great. He writes a pamphlet, a wonderful paper money is, and then he gets the paper money printing contract <laughs> from the Pennsylvania government. That's the way it worked. Okay, now, see, one of the things I just, as, as I go on with this sort of stuff, I think one of the important things to talk about strategy for, for liberty and free market, I think it's very important when we're dealing with the public or with ourselves, for that matter, or with scholars, but the problem is not just economic error. Of course, there's lots of economic error. You know, inflation is an economic error. Price control is an economic error. Subsidies are an economic error. It's more than that, how people, these guys are ripping us off. It's not just economic error. They've got a vested interest in economic error, which is one of the reasons it gets perpetuated. <laughs> and I think, and to ignore that is, 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 is sort of being extremely naive. And also, and also another thing is the public. We're talking about how to, what influences the public. The public gets very upset about this sort of stuff, and rightly so. The public. It's not so upset about flaws in economic theory, right? Because they don't know that much about economic theory. Uh, if you tell them hey, this is really an unsound banking, you know, they, they begin, their eyes begin to glaze over. If you tell them these guys are ripping us off, they're thieves, they, they, then they, they're, they, they're alert and they listen. So it's important not to have one hand tied behind our back <clears throat> in power elite analysis. OK, we come to the Civil War. Of course, it's weeping, weeping uh, very fast, but the uh, Again, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is a key thing. In the Civil War period, uh, one of my least favorite people in American history pops up. Uh, <laughs> Jay Cook, C-O-O-K-E, was an uh, investment banker in Philadelphia. One of the problems, just to say very simply here, one of the problems with commercial banking is they create money, and, they, and they, have, they ain't got it. They create liabilities to money, which they haven't got. So commercial banks are always inherently insolvent and ready for looking for government handouts to bail them out. That's the basic problem with commercial banks. The problem with investment bank, investment banking is not inflationary. It's, it's fine, it's theoretically fine. The problem with investment banks, a lot of their investment purchases are in government bonds, which gives them a stake in the government, which gives them a stake also in trying to increase taxes to have the poor taxpayer, the suckers, pay for the government bonds, pay them for the government bonds. A lot of American imperialism, for example, late 19th, early 20th century, when the Marines were sent down to Nicaragua and Cuba and Dominican Republic and lots of countries in Latin America, 
These are, by the way, forays which Americans don't know anything about. They're not taught in history books, but the people in Cuba, Nicaragua, the problem, they know they know very well about it. They, they're still it's still seething with resentment and for good reason about this. Uh, for example, Chase National Bank, a, a Morgan tool at that point, Morgan Bank, uh, buys government bonds, let's say, from Nicaragua or Cuba or whatever. Uh, the government bonds are not being paid off, okay? And so the Marines are sent, at the behest of Chase National Bank, the Marines are sent to, to Nicaragua or Cuba to force the government to increase their taxes so they can, so the, the poor the poor guys in Nicaragua and, and, and Cuba said we'll have to pay off the Chase, the Chase National Bank. This causes not a lot of resentment in, these, in Latin American countries. For, t- <laughs> for, t- for two reasons. One, because what are these Yankee troops go- going down there telling them what to do? And two, they're, they're increasing their taxes. What kind of free market is that? Right? It's supposed to be defense of the free market. It's obviously just the opposite. <clears throat> Seems to me if you buy government bonds, you should be lucky to get away with your hide, much less forcing taxpayers to pay for it. Uh, government bonds, of course, being a share in, gov- in, in, in future taxes, a share in loot. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, so Jay Cook, okay, Jay Cook, uh, uh, as, I, uh, as the war starts, Jay Cook had been a, a, a sort of modest Philadelphia banker, but the key thing about Jay Cook was Salmon P. Chase, a longtime Ohio politician, Cook was originally from Ohio, Cincinnati, uh, Jay Cook, I mean, Samuel Chase was on Jay Cook's payroll, in other words, Jay, Samuel Chase was usually in debt, he was a politician, Jay Cook was his padrone. He was paying him a huge amount of money, both not only for his campaign expenses, but also just on retainer. Uh, so Cook was sort of Chase's, I mean, Chase was sort of Cook's tool, okay? So when Chase, when the war starts, the Civil War starts, Chase is made, since he was a big shot Republican, he's made Secretary of Treasury on the Lincoln administration. Immediately upon which, uh, Jake, uh, Samuel Chase replaces, repays the kindness of Jay Cook by making him the monopoly underwriter of all government bonds for the duration. Monopoly underwriter of all government bonds, you have an enormous number of government bonds, of course, to finance the Civil War. Plus, he continued to be the monopoly underwriter, underwriter for government bonds from then on until 1873, with the exception of about one or two years after the war. Here's this guy, he's a monopoly of all government bonds. In other words, if you want to buy a government bond, you have to go through Jay Cook. So Cook is making a fortune out of this, and, and, and as a result of this, Cook <coughs> um, creates, is the first creator, the first innovator of what modern PR propaganda. Uh, because he wants to sell these bonds at a, at a, at a favorable rate, and he, he hires, he hires uh, pamphleteers to, to tell the public how wonderful government bonds are, how the great investment in America, and all the other nonsense you've heard time and time again. He really starts this whole thing, hiring PR men, hiring writers to lie about government bonds, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and he managed to sell a, a lot of them. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, J. Cook collaborates with the other Republicans, and I'll get it a little later about why the Republicans were and interested in all of this as an ideology, to eliminate uh, the, the, the semi-free banking system. We had, I'm not, I'm not a great, I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic about the banking system we had from 1840s and 50s, but certainly the best we've ever had or likely to have and, uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. And it was a banking system without a central bank because the Jacksonian, the libertarian Jacksonian movement managed to smash the central bank after a huge fight. Uh, and it managed to separate government from the banking system in general. And so it was more or less semi-free banking system with, with, with various flaws I haven't got time to go into. But anyway, it was relatively a good system. <clears throat> uh, so Cook, so a lot of the bankers, of course, wanted, didn't want to have that. They wanted a, a semi-central banking. They wanted to have another central bank. They, could, they felt they politically couldn't get away with it. So they decided to have a semi-central banking system called the National Banking System, which, which Cook maneuvered through Congress in particular. And, the, and the, what happens with, this is the acts of 1863 and 64. First of all, they essentially outlawed all state bank notes. In other words, state chartered banks had a prohibitive tax on them, so they couldn't circulate anymore. Uh, and, and they created a whole new group of nationally chartered banks, which are a very small group of very wealthy banks in New York and Philadelphia in particular, uh, which, which were the only banks allowed to to print banknotes, which meant that the state banks had only issued deposits, demand deposits, and they had to go to, they had to ha- have, they had to have accounts in the in these national banks in order if their, if their customers want to get the cash. So essentially, it was like the Federal Reserve System, as, 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 except instead of having a one national bank, there was a series like a dozen or so private Wall Street banks and Philadelphia banks that, uh, that were the base, the reserve base for the ex- expansion of credit of the state banks. 
In addition to that, but the interesting kicker for Jay Cook is that the, that the reserve requirements of the, of the national banks were gold, of course, plus government bonds. And the more government bonds, say, the Chase Bank bought, the more they could, money they could pyramid 10 to 1 or whatever on top of it. So this is a great market. So creating a, Jay Cook creating his own market for his own bonds. <laughs> this is called supply creating its own demand, not through Say's law, but through government action, government privilege. Also, Cook had a couple of, had a couple of um, <clears throat> uh, national banks of his own, which he owned, plus the fact that he had the, uh, I think, Union Pacific, uh, which he got also managed to get through this whole process, too. So he was in great shape. He was known as the tycoon, the first real multimillionaire in the United States, real monster. So uh, with Jay Cook, the same thing happened as with, as with Robert Morris, just as triumphed. Uh, Jay Cook went bankrupt in the Panic of 1873, which he did so much to bring about through bank credit expansion. This whole system collapses, this, this banking system collapses, railroads collapsed, most of the trans, transcontinental railroads went bankrupt then too, and Jay Cook was out of it, he had had it. He was brought low by his own evil actions. Uh, and uh, what happens is that uh, with, with Jay Cook, so that, that's sort of Jay Cook, that sort of ends the Philadelphia supremacy. After, well, no, it doesn't, it doesn't end, uh, all right, all right, one more step on that. Uh, <clears throat> after the Civil War was over, uh, the, um, we have the, the in, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, the, the venerable Henry C. Carey, economist, uh, former Bastiaf fan, now shifting to a status position, as you see, for his own benefit. Uh, I guess he's about in the 70s now. He's considered the venerable figure in Pennsylvania politics and economics. He's also himself an iron master, in other words, an iron manufacturer. He gathered about him what's called the Carey Vespers. Every Tuesday night or something, he had a salon and dinner. For a selected circle of big shots, the head of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, head of American Iron, Iron and Steel Institute, people like that, also the top iron and steel people and Republican officials. And he instructed them why it is, one, of course, protect, they all knew the protective tariffs are great, we need more and better protective tariffs, but also why it is that, we, that greenbacks, and green, fiat money inflation is good. It was, a, it was an excellent explanation of this thing. In other words, he told them, look, we should keep greenbacks as much as possible, not go back to the gold standard uh, for a long time, if ever, because the more we inflate the domestic money supply, the more the exchange rate drops, the, dollars, the dollar will drop, and the dollar will drop faster than domestic prices go up. So during this transition period, during this transition period, this is like a double tariff for, for iron and steel products. So will, this will stimulate steel exports and restrict steel imports. It was a brilliant analysis. I mean, Kerry is very bright, but just evil. Uh, it's possible, of course, and it happen, happens a lot, where intelligence is used in the service of, of evil. I'm going to explain later why I use the term evil. <laughs> okay, so we have, so this was, the, this was uh, I guess, the last, well, I should say also about the, the radical Republicans. There was a, uh, which Kerry is a member of the successful Republican Party. Uh, Robert Sharkey, it was an excellent book on, uh, called Money, Class, and Party, which came out many years ago, which was an excellent, excellent book of, power elite analysis after the Civil War, uh, he pointed out, in contrast to Beard, Beard, by the way, was the great pioneer of all this. I think he was a great historian, Charles Beard, and he, he, was, he used to be revived as like a pioneer. So Sharkey pointed out that the way it really was was that the, the Pennsylvania-led uh, party, led by iron manufacturer Henry C. Carey, iron manufacturer Congressman Thaddeus Stevens, who was also a, a, a big shot in, in the House of Representatives, an iron manufacturer, this whole group, what they wanted was high tariffs and, and greenbacks, greenback inflation, and that won out. Uh, Sharkey also said something that was close to my heart, which I remembered ever since in his introduction. He was talking about economic determinants. He said, look, nobody is saying that economic interest determines a person's action, but it's very rare the person votes or acts against his economic interest. <laughs> I think it's a very cute way to put it. Okay, the, uh, the, to get to the Civil War ideologists, <clears throat> um, the Republican Party, uh, so, and, and that was, it wasn't just isolated acts of this sort of intervention, the Republican Party put through, used the Civil War to put through their beloved program, which the Democratic Party, which was basically, basically a laissez-faire party throughout the 19th century. This is, of course, a culture shock for many of us to, to think of the Democratic Party as a libertarian party, a laissez-faire party. The, Whig, the Federalists, the Whigs, their successors, and the Republicans, their successors, were the status party. Okay? During the Civil War, the Republicans used the, the fact that it was almost a one-party Congress since the South had seceded <clears throat> to put through their entire economic program. 
what did they put through? They put through the income tax for the first time, a beloved tax, which is which they could try to continue after the war, but fortunately the uh, Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional, and was, that was finally repaired by the 16th Amendment. <clears throat> Uh, conscription for the first time, national conscription. Uh, locking up all the centers from the war effort without, without charge, without, uh, without indicting them or charge. In other words, violating the basic Anglo-Saxon rule of habeas corpus. Locking them up, by the way, and, and, and press all, anybody who was in favor of a peace, a peace with the South was locked up. Any politician or, or, press, or, or reporter or editor. By the way, jails in those days were not like they are now. Not exactly, there was no TV, there was no... <laughs> exercise around the courtyard or anything like that. It was, a very, it was a pretty monstrous, very high death rate. It wasn't just Andersonville, a Confederate jail, which everybody knows was, was rotten. It was also the northern jails, which are equally rotten, which don't get talked about. Since the northerners basically write the history. <clears throat> uh, high protective tariffs were put in. Um, massive subsidies to railroads. This is called the Partnership of Government and Industry. Railroads were the first big business then. They were the first, you know, manufacturing was nothing then. I mean, manufacturing was there, but it was these essentially small partnerships. Railroads were the first big corporation, the first big amassers of capital. <clears throat> Land grants and, 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 and construction subsidies to, uh, to railroads. Fiat money and greenback inflation, which, they, which Republicans stubbornly wanted to continue, as we know, with, as we see with Kerry. And only came back because the Democrats finally got, got you know, insisted on it and finally got it back in 1879. So we have, for eight, from 1860, from the Civil War until 1879, it was fiat money inflation. The National Banking Act, I've already talked about, and essentially nationalized the banking system. And high excise taxes on liquor, <laughs> liquor and tobacco, so-called sin taxes. They're called sin taxes for a good reason, which I'll mention in a minute. <clears throat> Uh, now the thing is, and this is a very important, there's a great book by Bob Higgs, who's a faculty member here, called Crisis in Leviathan, which I recommend to everybody, which demonstrates that the key aspect, for the key reason for the growth of government is essentially, has essentially been wars. There's also ideological reason, but wars are a key. Uh, Bob, Bob starts basically with World War, with the 1990s and World War I, it's, but it's been true ever since War of 1812. War, War of 1812 was a, was a big increase in statism, sort of like a ratchet effect. Big increase in statism in the War of 1812. High protective tariffs. There was embargoes. There was big navy. There was uh, uh, the Bank of the United States. Uh, excise taxes. All this was. It took the Jacksonian libertarians about 20, 30 years to wash it out of the system. It took 30, it took till the 1840s before we finally got free trade, hard money, separation of government, and banking, the end of public works, and all the rest of it. So it took about 30 years for the Jacksonians to reverse the statism of War, War of 1812. The statism of the Civil War, the big leap forward into, into statism, was never washed out. It was slightly moderated by 1914, but never washed out. Of course, 1914 was another tremendous leap up, and then World War II, and we're off to the races. But it's always war that's the key ratchet effect. <clears throat> war, as Randolph Bourne, of course, said, is the health of a state. Uh, unless the state is actually beaten by another state, actually crushed by another state, which doesn't have a too often, especially in the United States, then war is obviously the big occasion for expansion of the state. Uh, okay, I, I, I said I, I, I'm going to explain why I use the words like uh, evil and, and uh, swine and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, I'm doing it deliberately. I'm doing it, of course, because I believe it, for one thing. I'm certainly, but also, the second reason, to emphasize the fact that history, the historian should also engage in moral judgments. This is a very unfashionable position. Um, the... Um, Lord Acton is my guide here. Lord, Lord Acton, the great uh, libertarian uh, man of letters and, and theoretician, late 19th century, said that the, an historian, said the judge, the historian should be a judge, a moral judge, and also a hanging judge when that's necessary. <laughs> and the way I look at it is if you can't get the guy, if the guy doesn't get his just desserts on earth, we should, the historian should at least give it to him. <laughs> it might be a poor substitute, but the only substitute we've got. How do, we get, how do we get a hold of Jay Cook and give him the business or whatever, if only by historical truth? Now, this is, this is very different from the, from the Marxist view. You notice that you know, the, Fidel Castro made a famous speech, which used to be reprinted everywhere in the old days, where it called, History Will Absolve Me, where essentially his crimes and his murders will be absolved by the, by the, by, by the march of history. What, what that meant was that Marxists, Marxists believe that they, have a, they know the objective laws of history, and history is on their side because the working class is bound to win out, etc. Therefore, anything they do as a means to achieve the victory of the working class is, is good. 
and history will then absolve them from what seems to be crimes. This is a very different position. I'm not talking about the laws. As a historian, I believe that uh, if you read Theory and History, it's a wonderful book. He emphasizes this. But the, what the economist, what the historian does is to use, apply all the, the disciplines that he knows, the economic theory, medicine, psychology, whatever, whatever the disciplines happen to be, technology, to try to explain historical events, using for stain and judgment and so forth to do it. Uh, but since he did not believe that ethics is a discipline, since he thought ethics were purely emotive, uh, he, did, he didn't believe that historians should apply it. But if you believe, as I do, that ethics is a discipline, then you have the obligation to apply it, uh, which is what, of course, I try to do. <clears throat> uh, the ethics is not that difficult, but I'll try to explain it either the end of this hour or the next hour, why I think, why, uh, briefly, why I have these ethical positions. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> The interesting thing here is that historians, of course, don't, don't really obey this rule. They're phony value-free. It's all a lot of nonsense. They pretend to be value-free. They pretend not to use moral judgment. They do it all the time, except they do it uh, covertly. Uh, for example, if you read almost any biography of Franklin D. Roosevelt, it's brimming with love and adoration, right? <laughs> with hagiography. It's disgusting, but they don't say... Uh, and uh, almost any other president, great, so-called great president, brimming with adoration, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Abraham Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the only time they really, frankly, admit they're engaging in value, value judgment is when they write about somebody like Hitler. Hitler, it's okay when you talk about Hitler to say that he's evil. See? So the difference between me and the regular historians is I have a, a smaller list of good guys, a much bigger list of bad guys I don't, <laughs> than they do. I don't think that Hitler and Stalin were the only criminals in the history of the world. Okay, so the uh, so it's really the same uh, the same basis, but it's the uh, same principle, uh, except they don't they refuse to admit it. It's phony value freedom, just like most economists will claim to be value free and also say the government should expand the uh, money supply by 3.5 percent, blah blah blah, uh, are really of course not value free, but they just don't admit it. So they have no ethical system or no ethical principles to, that they can defend. Uh, another thing I must say about history, this sort of history, using moral judgments, is a lot more fun than Orthodox history. Than, uh, uh, I, remember, uh, I remember when I took a, a course in economic, European economic history at Columbia University Graduate School, uh, the, the, the professor was Shepard Bancroft Clough, a distinguished historian. Uh, I was really a nice enough guy and everything, all those positions were about the op direct opposite of mine, but uh, he was a pro-mercantilist, he thought the fascism was a wonderful system. Uh, this, these were the days when liberals were pro-fascist. This was uh, before the, the shift. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is, he droned on. All, all he, we only, and it's sort of a low monotone. All he talked about was he, he was listing tables of exports, things like that. And uh, I don't think, you know, it's not, it's not exactly a zinger. It's, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't stir the blood. <laughs> okay. Much less, of course, econometric you know, equations hardly do it either. Okay, the... Um, Okay, I want to explain my basic framework for economic history, and, and, uh, and uh, this will, I think, also sort of imply the moral categories I'm using. The basic framework is essentially set forth by two great social and political thinkers, Franz Oppenheimer, the late 19th century German sociologist, and Albert J. Nock, his disciple. Uh, Franz Oppenheimer wrote a great book called The State. Uh, I think in German it's much bigger, but it's... it's and since I don't read German, unfortunately, I've read the smaller English version of it. And Albert J. Knox's book, Our Enemy, the State. You can see, exactly, you see more or less what the trend here is. <laughs> it's a wonderful book, applying, uh, applying this to American history, the basic, the basic framework of American history. Basically, the thesis is this, the, the oppenheimer Knox thesis. Um, there are two ways to acquire wealth, which, by which an individual can acquire wealth. One is by producing something and exchanging it for the wealth of somebody else, it's some other production. You have, you have two producers and you have a voluntary exchange. This is productive, this is mutual benefit of each exchange, and this brings about a division of labor and prosperity and all the rest of it. The second way, the second way to achieve wealth is by robbing it, by hitting somebody over the head and stealing it. Uh, this method uh, is, uh, is parasitic. It's, of course, it benefits the guy who hits the guy over the head at the expense of the other guys. You have a, instead of both parties benefiting, one ex benefits the expense of the other. It's parasitic, because the more robbers you've got, the less uh, the, less the rob will produce. Uh, and if, so eventually this continues, the parasite will destroy the host and itself in the long run. 
And so robbery is a dysfunctional method, to say the least, of, of production. <clears throat> and, um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear now why you can say that, that the productive and voluntary way is the, is the, is the, is the good way, and the uh, way of robbery is the evil way, not even going to any other aspects of this, uh, this doctrine. Uh, the, uh, interestingly enough, Oppenheimer defined the ex root of the voluntary exchange to wealth as the economic means for the achievement of wealth. He defined the robbery, the method of robbery to achieve wealth, as the political means for the achievement of wealth. And then he went on to define the state as the, as the organization, the regularization of the political means for the achievement of wealth. I think it's magnificent, it's a beautiful way to define it because it really sums it up. Uh, cuts through all the baloney about the state being the, the, the father of the country and all the rest of it, and, and, uh, and a social contract. Of course, there's never been any social contract. Uh, and all the rest of it. And it cuts through the real essence of it, which is essentially the regularization of the political means. Whereas Nock said the, the state, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the orthodox definition of the state is of the government as the, as the an, out, an organization which has the monopoly of force in a given territorial area. That's the sort of Max Weber standard definition. Nock refined that and uh, improved on it by saying that defining the state as the organization, as the organization which uh, attempts to achieve a monopoly of crime in its territorial area. <laughs> Individual criminals, because interfering with their particular racket. Uh, notice, for example, just, just, just look at the, at the degree of punishment which the state levies against private, inter-private crime, like mugging, raping, murdering, etc. And they're sort of fairly lax and blasé about that sort of crime and the severity which the state goes after crimes against the state, namely not paying income taxes or counterfeiting, which interferes with the state's monopoly on counterfeiting. These the state takes very seriously. And when, they, when, you, when the state catches a counterfeiter or an income tax evader, they don't worry about the fact that he's been deprived of playgrounds as a youth or as he came from a broken home. They don't care. They just lock, lock him up and throw the key away. Because then that's really serious. That's interfering with the state's revenue. <laughs> Now, Nock went on to, uh, to define, uh, I think it's a wonderful distinction. Hazlitt, Henry Hazlitt, in his review of the book, didn't like it, but I think it's a wonderful distinction. Uh, Nock summed up the array of, e of economic, of voluntary interactions, economic exchanges, prosperity, et cetera, and voluntary interactions like science, art, culture, all that. He defined that as, as social power, namely, this is the product, the fruits of voluntary interaction, creative and voluntary interaction. He defined uh, the state and its organization, its exercise of the state, as state power. So you have state power versus social power. And, he, and essentially, he looked at history, and I think it's a beautiful insight. Economic history and history in general is a race between state power and social power. In other words, social power creates stuff. It creates product, production. It creates art and music and, and science and all the rest of it. And then the goddamn state comes along and tries to tax it, loot it, cripple it, distort it and finally kill it if, it, if it can. And so what you have, you look at uh, the advance of history as a race between these two forces. Obviously, in the 19th century, late 18th and 19th century, social power burst ahead with a tremendous increase in creativity, leaving state power behind. So the relative degree of state parasitism was much lower. And then the 20th century, of course, is the century of the state caught up. And this is the problem, of course, with the 20th century. I think it's a beautiful way of looking at it. It more or less defines my, my framework. <clears throat> um, Okay. The, um, <clears throat> Frederick, Frederick Boss, just another thing on this. How, how long should I go on for the break? Oh, okay, fine. Uh, the, um, Frederick Bastiat, the Frederick Bastiat defined the state, also an excellent definition, as, as that organization in which, or the fiction, excuse me, the fiction in which everyone tries to benefit at the expense of everybody else. Uh, um, a better refinement of that was John C. Calhoun, another great uh, thinker, great political thinker, who said, who said the state inevitably creates net taxpayers and net tax consumers. In other words, the state doesn't, bureaucrats, for example, don't pay taxes. That's only a fiction. You know, the, the, uh, if a guy gets his salary from the, from the, from the government of 100000 a year and pays 20000 in taxes, he's not paying any taxes. He's simply a net tax consumer of 80000 That's only an accounting fiction to lure the public into thinking they're really paying taxes. The, uh, the beloved bureaucrats of the United Nations in New York, they don't pay any taxes at all. People are resenting that, but they really, it's the same thing. I mean, nobody pay, no government officials pay taxes. It's just a, an accounting fiction. At least they don't have an accounting fiction there. At any rate, 
So, so Calhoun says, well, any, even if the government does nothing else, even if the government is very minimal, doesn't do anything else, they still create, the government ipso facto creates a, ta a class conflict, or as Mises would say, a caste conflict between the taxpayers and the tax consumers, or immediately a class conflict between them. And most laissez-faire theorists don't even think of that, of course, in, to, in, in those terms. They think of taxes as being somehow neutral, at least minimal tax. They're not neutral, they're never neutral. They always create a uh, class conflict. Calhoun, of course, concluded the state should be as minimal as possible to, 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 re to reduce the degree of this kind of exploitation. Um, there's the libertarian class analysis, which I think somebody here will be talking about at some length, and Hans Hoppe will give a class on it. Basically, it is, and most people don't realize this, that the, the Marxian class theory is a, is a bastardized version of libertarian class theory, it's sort of a, a distorted version. Uh, libertarian class analysis started uh, with two groups of people. I don't know if they're independent or not. I really haven't done the research on that. One is about the same time. One was the French libertarians, Charles Comte and Charles Dunoyer, around 1815, after the, uh, after the rest restoration of the Bourbons and the end of Napoleon. They started working on writing on this sort of thing, and they were both not only libertarians, but they both, as Comte, by the way, was the son-in-law of J.B. Say, as a much neglected a uh, libertarian free market economist, uh, they worked out the following doctrine, that, the, that, the, um, that there's, a, there's always a ruling class, and the ruling class is those, are those people who get control of the state, that they get net taxes, they also get other privileges which they give for themselves, and the rule are the guys who are, of course, paying for all this, the mass of the public. And they go through an historical analysis, too. They go through, this is the Marx, those who know about Marx seem familiar, there's Oriental despotism, it's in ancient China, where they... The, the emperor and the bureaucracy exploit, loot the peasants and the, everybody else through taxes. There's feudalism, which the, in which the uh, groups of landlords through land monopoly uh, grab uh, taxes and land rent from, from the peasants and the rest of the people. And then, then says Comte de as industrial revolution develops, as, as, a, as, a, we, as we, we, we need a free market to, to support, to run an industrial system, as this develops, they, we will inevitably get, they said, a classless society because we'll get a society where government will wither away. They use the term withering away of the state. They said the state will eventually wither away because it's inefficient, it's exploitative, and you have a vast network throughout the world of, of free markets and free exchanges, essentially anarcho-capitalism, as we call it now. Uh, and uh, what they meant by classless society is no ruling elite. As a matter of fact, Dunway and Comte actually used the, the Marxian phrase before Marx Eventually, the government, the government of men will be replaced by the administration of things, which of them meant there'd be no power over people, it'd just be power over property, you know, just, just be property ownership. Uh, well, what happened uh, with that, this libertarian class analysis of France is that Saint Simon, who was, a, was a aristocrat, idle aristocrat, liked to, never read anything as far as I know, but liked to listen to people, sort of conversational type, uh, picked this up. He was engaged in salons. He picked up this class analysis and distorted it, got it screwed up, and had the and then his disciples were socialists, one of the first socialists, and then systematized this, changing the thing so that keeping, and by the way, Marx and Lenin continue the same practice, keeping the Oriental despotism and feudalism analysis, saying that, yes, yes, under Oriental despotism and feudalism, the ruling class are those who manage to get control of the state. That makes them the rulers. Okay? But suddenly when you get to capitalism, you get to a wage contract, suddenly it's different. And suddenly the employer is exploiting the worker. And it's never really explained. And it shifts the definition from those who run the state to those who are simply a wage contract. And then the Marxian analysis of the state is that the, the ruling class, namely employers, then get control of the state and use that as a sort of a super exploitation, like exploitation squared. But the original, exploit, the original exploitation is the, is the wage contract, which totally, is totally contradictory to the, to the other class analysis of Marx. Uh, Mises like to point out that you know, Marx, Marx and Marx has been writing about class, I mean, millions of words about it. Marx spent all of his life writing about it and never defined it. Because if you don't define it, you can, slip, you can be slippery about it. You can talk about employers, you can talk about two classes, you can talk about the financial capitalism, industrial capitalism, you, you know, you can, you can be very slippery. And the, in the third volume of Das Kapital, uh, Marx says, I now will proceed to define class. This is after talking about it this after a long time. And he, he says a few paragraphs about it, and then that's it. Just as he's about to define it, he stops, and Engels, his uh, faithful uh, donor, a patron, and, and stooge, Engels, an editor, Engels writes underneath, at this point, the manuscript breaks off. Well, gee, it looks like, boy, poor Marx, he died in the process, you know, with a pen there. 
as he's about to define class. But if he, he, worked, he stopped working on it for about 15 years. He never did any work after that. He was fooling Engels, claiming he was working on this great book. Instead, he was learning Danish, doing all sorts of other, wasting his time. <laughs> Presumably because he couldn't define class. Only he had reached the point where he realized the whole thing is futile. I hope so, anyway. But anyway, that's... Uh, so we had, uh, so as a result, of course, Marxian theory of uh, class gets, gets all the, 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 pre, the press and the play and the libertarian theory dies out. Another, um, another independent creator, I think, of the, of the libertarian class theory is James Mill. He's one of my favorite economists. He's, not that I agree with him, I disagree with him at least half the time, but he's a very interesting figure, a char charismatic figure, and, and essentially Ricardo's control. I mean, Ricardo is getting more and more convinced with the only thing he knew about was money and banking, where he was very good and much better, by the way, than Mill. But everything else he knew nothing, and Mill was just feeding him stuff, just forcing him, quote unquote, to do stuff. Anyway, Mill uh, was, uh, had a class analysis about the same time, but didn't have the historical stuff. It was simply two classes, the rulers and the ruled. As the, and uh, the, the minority rulers would get control of the state, the few versus the many, what they call the privileged few versus the exploited many. He called them, by the way, this, I, I like this part, not, he didn't, you, didn't just use the term special interest, he said these are the sinister interests. <laughs> I like that. The sinister interests versus the mass of the public are being exploited. Okay, how, do, how does this exploitation take place to revert to get out of Marx and class analysis? How does, the, how does this minority exploiters get away with it? Because as David, as Etienne de la Boitie pointed out in the 1550s, as David Hume pointed out 200 years later, as Mises pointed out in Human Action, you can't have a government, a state, existing for, for, for in the long run without majority consent of some sort. You can't just have, you know, 100 people using force against 5,000 or 20,000 because eventually they, they just turn on, you know, just, just rip you apart. The majority is going to win out. And we know that even the most dictatorial governments, even, you know, even uh, so Soviet Russia under Stalin and stuff, they used to have a vast propaganda machine to, to bamboozle the public. They just didn't just use, quote, force, unquote. So, so the, then the question is, the, what I call the mystery of civil obedience. The real, the real mystery, the real problem in political science is the mystery of civil obedience. Why do people obey the state? Why do they obey these yokels over there? Ten guys sit in a room, they issue orders to 500,000 people, and they all obey it. Why do they do How do they get away with this? And one of the, to me, one of the most wonderful things in, in, his, in history is when you see a situation where the state crumbles and nobody obeys the orders anymore. This, this happened in Pennsylvania during the American Revolution, when the old colonial government was sitting there, they thought they were the legislature, they're issuing edicts and orders, nobody paid attention, there were just 10 guys and 20 guys in a room. Everybody ignored them, they set up, the people set up alternative governments of their own. It's great, but it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so uh, why, why do they, why, how do they get away with this? How do, they, how do they get the public to obey? And the answer, of course, is they, the state rulers form an alliance with the, with the organized intellectuals, with the opinion molding classes, in other words, intellectuals who bamboozle the public of telling them that the state is good, the state is wonderful, the state is even divine, if they can get away with that in the old days. So you have, so this is, this is, the, this is the alliance of throne and altar, the old European conservatives love so much. Throne and altar, you've got the, you've got the king and the, and the nobles, etc., you've got the intellectuals who do it. Um, and, and until this, the 18th and 19th century, 17th century, in the history of the world, all intellectuals were churchmen. There was no, no such thing as lay pamphleteers writing stuff. They were all churchmen, okay? So, Basically, it's the alliance of church and state. <clears throat> and the reason why, I'm, uh, one of the great things about the United States, the separation of church and state, is not just the separation, not just you don't have prayers in the public school, that nonsense. The point, the real point there, real glory of it is, you don't have a fusion of the state and the church. You don't have this unholy alliance. And the, uh, the unholy alliance works like this. The church tells the public, the believers, the state is wonderful, the, the state is divine even, the state has divine sanction, therefore you must obey the state. It's evil and sinful not to do it. God will punish you if you don't. And then, in return for that, the state kicks in part of the loot to the church. The state pays the church and, and, you know, tax, out of the tax loot and pay, gives them prestige and all that. So you have a very cozy alliance with throne and altar, church and state. And nobody suffers except, of course, the mass of the public who will dupe by all this and pay the taxes and, and believe this stuff. So the great thing about... Uh, the modern world, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, I'll use a very loose term, modern, is you have, you have the growth of independent intellectuals, you have a growth of, of property ownership in the middle class where people can afford, don't have to be churchmen, don't have to be part of the state apparatus to, to, to write stuff and, and publish stuff. Uh, and as part of that, you have a falling away, you have a growth, of course, of, of libertarian thought. I'll get into that in my seminar. But the, but the, uh, uh, 
uh, you have a falling away of this alliance. And in my, in my view, and, and in the United States, what you do, and in America, you don't have this alliance. Basically, you have a very free system of growth of libertarian thought. And what, what happens in the, around 1900, starting in the late 19th century, especially around 1900, is a realliance of state and intellectual. The state forms a new alliance, a new form of state, mostly big business oriented, but also other people, form an alliance of intellectuals, not just churchmen now, but lay intellectuals. There's a, of course, a tremendous growth of lay intellectuals, technocrats, scientists, economists, historians, PhD menship, and all the rest of it, but flooding late, well, during the late, latter part of the 19th century. So now you have a new alliance, a new fascinating church state or intellectual state, to make it broader, on the American people, and the people in Europe, too. This is going on throughout the Western world. A new mercantilism with new, uh, with new rhetoric. Now, the point, now, the interesting problem they had for this, for this new alliance, I'll get to this next hour, is um, how do you get away with this in the United States particularly? The United States is born an anti-monopoly and a libertarian thought. It's born an anti-monopoly opinion, namely, the, by the way, monopoly meant in those days the government granting a monopoly privilege, like branding Jay Cook monopoly of, under, of uh, underwriting government bonds. It didn't mean charging a high price, having a high concentration of an industry and that, that crap. It meant the government giving a monopoly privilege, <laughs> very simple. So the United States was born in, a, in hatred of this and reaction against the Boston Tea Party and all the rest of it, against the uh, tea monopoly and high taxes. So how, does the, how does the government get away with this when big business being, begins to move in the late 19th century to reestablish cartelization, as we'll see as we, in the next hour, how do they get away with this? How do they get the American public to be suckers and fall for it? And the way they do it is a form of alliance with intellectuals. You know, this I'm sort of summing up the next hour, but the point is the intellectuals, the tremendous growth among intellectuals, period, during the late 19th century. In the old days, you weren't an engineer, you were a mechanic, a sort of you know, tool and dime man. Then you had engineering schools coming up, and you had licensed this and licensed that and, and all that, of uh, shrinks, physicians, Social workers, economists, all that sort of stuff. They, and what do they want? They want prestigious jobs and an income they like to achieve, which they probably could not get on the free market. And the state was ready to, to give it to them. The state was the, 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 the unholy alliance was this. The new alliance was this, starting around 1900 or so. The new alliance was, in return, the, the, the intellectuals tell the public they have to have government intervention. They have to, the modern economy requires it, and blah, blah, blah. You need to curb big business and all the rest of it. In return for which, the big business run state, basically, uh, grants these intellectuals jobs in the government apparatus, planning, et cetera, and also, of course, uh, propagandizing, apologizing for the new system. So uh, you have, so it's a very, it's a, again, a very happy alliance. The only, the only people who suffer from, of course, are the rest of us. Okay, I guess I'll continue the next hour. I'll have a break now. Thank you.